All right, so I got a little cut off in the last video, but we're going to pick up here with where we left off. Get this out of the way. All right. Okay, so what are weather variables? Weather variables are any weather factor that can change. Okay, this is what you're typically going to measure or discuss when talking about the weather forecasts and what you're experiencing outside, etc. So, for example, scientists use thermometers to measure the change in temperature. That would be a weather variable, how hot or cold it is outside. Um, probably the weather variable that most people are concerned about, that one and precipitation, which we'll get to in a minute. Here are some other weather variables. Uh, like I said, temperature, how hot or cold something is. Uh, relative humidity. This has to do with the amount of water vapor that's in the air at that moment. Um, most people are concerned about um, the rainfall, the amount of precipitation coming down. Um, but precipitation and water in the air, which is the next one here, precipitation, how much is rained or snowed, is not just water falling from the sky, it's any form of water. So snow, ice, sleet, hail, um, rain, even anything like that. Humidity, though, is more like what we see in this second picture here, okay? Kind of foggy, uh, lots of um, wetness in the air. It can make you sweat a little more, it can make your, um, or maybe a little easier. Um, it can make your hair a little fluffier <laughs> or frizzy, uh, especially for us girls, but um, this has to do with just how thick and uh, sticky humid it is outside. Kind of like, you know, when you take a really hot shower and you step out of the shower and it's, or you walk into the bathroom after someone's taking a really hot shower and it's just like warm and sticky feeling. That's an example of humidity. And last one on this page is wind direction, which is the compass direction from where the wind is coming. North, south, east, west, northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast, etc. Next, we have wind speed, which is pretty self-explanatory, how fast the air is moving past an observation point, okay? So that basically just means you pick a spot and then measure how fast the air is moving past that spot or how fast it moves from one place to another. Then we have air pressure, which is the force of air pushing in all directions. Uh, we talked about this with our syringe investigation a little bit, how when we were trying to push that uh, the plunger down in the syringe, it built up pressure on the other end where all the air was being compressed. Um, this is not exactly the same. It's the same concept, but it's not anything uh, compressing the air. It really has more to do with um, how heavy the air is based on uh, how much condensation or water is in the air. So warmer air, cooler air, all of that can determine how much pressure the air is uh, building up. This also uh, explains why sometimes maybe you have someone in your family or maybe even a parent that uh, maybe has an old injury. Uh, my sister, for example, she when she was younger, she uh, fractured her elbow. And whenever there's a uh, high air pressure outside, she could, she, when we were growing up, she would say, oh, like my elbow really hurts today. And it had to do with the fact that the air pressure was way up. Um, and it's not necessarily because her elbow's magic or anything, but because that weak spot on her body, um, because it has been hurt before, it's more susceptible, right? Um, it feels the pressure a little more here uh, where she has that uh, previous injury. Next um, is visibility. This is the distance you can see through the air at ground level. Let me show you these next pictures that help explain it a little bit better, okay? Over here on the right, you see the picture of me. This is from when I hiked um, Mount Bierstadt in Colorado. It was a 14,000 foot mountain. I believe it's the only 14er I've ever hiked, but um, this picture shows you a really good example of good visibility. You can see very, very far into the background. These little tiny mountains out way out here, these are miles and miles and miles and miles away from where I am. But because the air is so clear, you can see extremely far. Okay, you can also see I was uh, representing for my college club softball team that I played on at the time. So that was kind of fun. But this hike was extremely hard, but the views were pretty rewarding at the top. My, my little brother actually went with me and to this day we still talk about the trip so <laughs> quite memorable. But then over here we have a picture of, uh, this, I was not actually personally in this picture, but um, this is an example of really bad visibility. You can see this poor little car here is probably not going to be able to see super far down the road because um, there's lots of uh, humidity, fog, thickness in the air and he's not going to be able to see very far. Um, this is especially common during a rainstorm or a thunderstorm. Um, typically, that reduces the visibility by quite a bit. OK, 
can't see nearly as far. Also, this is my picture from Meet the Teacher, just in case anyone was, you know, connecting that. Okay, so no, those are a few of the weather variables um, that we look for. Next, we're going to talk about the instruments we use to measure these variables. Um, the first one is the barometer. This is pronounced barometer, not barometer, barometer. This measures air pressure in millibars. This is just, uh, millibars is just the unit for air pressure. Um, next, we have the anemometer. This is not an anemometer, <laughs> okay, anemometer. This measures wind speed in kilometers per hour. Um, on the next slide, I have some pictures of these. I'll show you in just a minute. Then we have the hygrometer. Uh, an easy way to remember that this one is the one that measures uh, humidity or water in the air uh, is hygro is very similar to hydro. Uh, that usually makes people think of water. Next, we have the wind vane. This is actually pretty common. You've probably seen one of these before, especially in decorations, but this measures the wind direction, which, like I said, is the compass direction from which the wind is coming. All right, here are some examples. Up here in the top left, this would be our example of a barometer, measuring how much pressure there is in the air at the time. Here we have an example of a hygrometer. This is actually pretty uh, low humidity. It's pointing at the 30, so it's 30% 30 humidity. If it's raining or a super uh, humid day, you'll probably have something anywhere from 80 to 100% humidity. Uh, 60 and 70 can still be pretty wet too. So, um, But anyway, that's a hygrometer. Here we have an anemometer. Uh, this is also uh, kind of cool looking, but up here on the top, there's these cups basically that they, they serve as a purpose to kind of catch the wind. As the wind blows into them, the cups move and spin around. And the faster that they spin, um, the higher the speed is recorded down here at the bottom. Okay, so maybe, you know, seven miles per hour, 13 miles per hour, or kilometers per hour, whatever it may be. Then over here, uh, let me get my regular mouse back so I can move my screen. But down here, um, this is the example of a wind vane. Uh, most of you have probably seen some of these like this. You can usually find them on tops of houses or maybe on patios or uh, barns, etc. But they just uh, point to the direction from which the wind is coming. So for example, uh, in this picture here, it looks like the wind is blowing from the northwest side. Okay, so all of those things have to do with climate, which we just described is instantaneous. It happens in just a moment. Uh, has to do with a certain time and place. However, climate, which is the second bullet point here, climate is the typical or predictable atmospheric conditions of a given place near the Earth's surface. So this is going to be something that um, what you would expect the weather would be like. It may not actually match up with what it is right now, but it's what it normally is in that area at that time. So for example, the weather in Florida right now is rainy and windy, perhaps. This is just an example. But the climate of Florida, what you would typically expect, is sunny and hot. Even though right now maybe it's raining in the certain area of Florida that you're talking about, the climate of what you would typically expect in, in Florida is hot and sunny, okay? So those are the two different kinds, or the two differences between um, climate and weather. So climate describes the expected conditions of weather, okay? If you're going to travel, if I told you we were going to go on a trip to um, a new place, um, I can't even think of a clever location name right now. But if I told you we were going to take a class trip to somewhere you've never been before, um, but the climate of that area is mm, snowy, about 22 degrees Fahrenheit, and very, very windy, right? That's what we'd expect the weather to be like. So you're going to then pack, you know, jackets and boots and gloves and scarves and hats and things like that to help keep you warm in that kind of climate. This is what we would expect of that area. Now, how do we figure out what an area's climate would be? Climate is based on weather data for at least the last 30 years. So climatologists, um, which are scientists that study climate, they uh, keep track of the weather data for 30 years, and then they kind of pile all that together to determine what the climate of that area would be like. So here we have a, a climate guide for Key West, which is an island down south of Florida. You can see very warm temperatures, especially in um, June, July, and August right here. You can see lots of rainfall in the summer. 
and then pretty much consistently lots and lots of hours of sunshine. Okay, that's what you could typically expect in Key West. Now, it may be that there's a cold front coming through and it gets a little bit colder than what's normally expected in Key West, but that would be the weather. Okay, climate is, like I said, what we would normally expect for that area. There are a couple of factors we use to determine climate. These are moisture, rainfall, temperature, and seasonal variations. Typically, we're mostly concerned about how much rainfall is in the area, how wet is the air, is it thick and sticky or is it pretty dry, and then how hot or cold is the area typically. The two weather variables that are the most important for determining which kind of climate zone an area is in are the average temperature and the average amount of moisture per year, which is largely determined by how by where they are located on the globe okay so there are uh, five major climate regions of the world you can find more specific kinds in other places but um, there are typically five general ones the ones that we're going to go over first we have a tropical climate area this is where the average temperature for all the months is greater than 64 degrees fahrenheit so it's very warm there pretty much all the time this is located in the region between the equator and the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, okay? Uh, for example, this is gonna be the Hawaiian Islands. If you've uh, been following along in history, we've talked about the, the Tropic of Cancer and Capricorn. Uh, this is a, the tropical climate zone, is right in that kind of middle section of the globe and it goes all the way around the circle, right there on the equator where it gets the hottest. Next climate zone is the desert areas. This is where evaporation could exceed precipitation. That means that water um, evaporates or dries up faster than it falls down, meaning the area is very dry almost all the time. And precipitation or rainfall is less than 25 centimeters or 10 inches per year. Some examples would be West Texas, if you've been out there before, or Arizona, New Mexico, um, very dry climate. You can see there's not a whole lot of tall trees, meaning there's not a whole lot of water in that area either. That would be a desert climate. Next, we have temperate areas. This is kind of another way of saying like moderate or mild climate. This is where the coldest month of the year has an average temperature higher than about zero degrees Fahrenheit, but below about 64 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, which would be negative three degrees Celsius and 18 degrees Celsius for the upper. So typically hangs out somewhere between zero and 64 degrees. This is gonna be most of the United States, okay? Summers can be hot, winters can be cold. Um, they pretty much have all four seasons. There's no extreme really on either side. Some examples include areas like Washington, North Carolina, Mississippi, um, really a good number of the states, but you're gonna see a lot of, uh, like in the picture you see a lot of um, colors, lots of vegetation, lots of greenery, lots of plants growing. Um, it's just a good climate kind of all around. It's cold in the winter, hot in the summer, kind of get the best of both worlds. Next, we have the subarctic. This is where the coldest months have temperatures below negative three degrees Celsius. These are areas that get extremely, extremely cold, uh, below freezing, below zero degrees, sometimes even negative. And summers are not as cold, obviously, but they're not super hot either. They're typically pretty mild. These are going to be the northern United States areas, sometimes even into Canada, such as Montana, South Dakota, and Minnesota. And then our last major region is the Arctic or polar region. Um, sounds just like it's, it, or is just like it sounds. It's very cold, lots of snow, lots of ice. The winters are long and cold. In fact, there's usually um, some times of the year where there's not a whole, sun, whole lot of sunlight at all. It's very cold, very dark. There is a very short, mild season. We wouldn't necessarily call it summer in these areas, um, but there it's at least not as cold as it normally is. And the temperature gets above freezing only a few months of the year. It is typically just a barren ice land, okay? For example, Northern Alaska, Antarctica, um, North Pole, those kinds of areas. So our last little section here, uh, I know it's getting kind of long, so I'm gonna try and move fast. Uh, scientists who study climate are called climatologists. Um, you'll find that most scientists who are experts at something, uh, their type of name ends in IST, IST, like a biologist or an optometrist 
or a um, kinesiologist, okay? Um, lots of different kinds there. But anyway, climatologists is assigned to disease climate. And what they do, these scientists look at the records of Earth's air and water temperatures throughout history, and they closely monitor any major changes in the last 100 years, such as uh, has the atmospheric gases changed, or is, is there more carbon dioxide in this area than before? What can we do to help that? What kind of effects will that cause, etc.? These are some of the guys who probably closely watch the ozone layer. Okay, and then some impacts of climate change. If an area's climate change uh, is super drastic and happens quite uh, frequently, scientists are concerned that as the temperature of the earth increases, glaciers and ice caps will begin to melt, which will cause um, sea levels to rise. This would mean uh, more droughts, weather extremes, and they're concerned that, that would make it difficult to grow food in different parts of the world. Uh, I am one of the scientists that doesn't completely subscribe to this idea, so I don't think it's a huge deal, but there are many scientists that do. Um, they are uh, pretty adamant about protecting global warming and helping prevent that. Um, but I am a fan of this. There are ways that we can help reduce climate change um, by reducing the amount of carbon dioxide emission into the air and not burning fossil fuels. This is going to be things like gasoline, um, uh, toxic waste, nuclear waste, um, lots of just machinery type waste. Um, this, there are ways that we can get the energy we need by, uh, without having to burn as much energy. So we're going to talk, we're going to talk in the next couple of weeks about different ways we can conserve energy. And the reason why we're, we're mentioning this in our weather and climate notes is because it will, the goal is that, that will help control the weather and, and help us not see some major, major climate change. So, for example, something like uh, riding, the, riding bikes instead of driving cars, turning your heater lower and maybe just putting on an extra jacket instead of having to burn more energy in the winter. Things like that that just kind of help save energy. Oh, okay. That's it. So, um, and, and before I say this, let me make sure... I thought I had an assignment today, but it might just be, oh, I do. Okay. So, um, in, instead of having you write a summary, I have, I have some questions for you guys to answer based on this lesson and the past lesson. Um, and that will be kind of your lesson closing for today. Otherwise tomorrow we're going to begin talking about the water cycle and how all of these weather factors like precipitation, um, wind speed, evaporation, temperature, outside, et cetera, help this flow of water throughout our planet um, continue and it never really ends. So um, answer the questions and then I'll see you tomorrow.